Hi, my name is David Allison. I'm the founder of the Value Graphics Database, the Value Graphics Project. We wrote this new book called The Death of Demographics. We're going to talk about that a bunch. And the best advice I ever got was to figure out what makes you uniquely you and then go out there into the world and be the most extreme version of yourself that you can possibly be. So there you have it. I love that advice. I love that advice. And the book is great too, by the way. So David, we're going to talk about the book, but first you got to tell me about that advice. Who gave you that advice? Cause that's awesome. Uh, it's all name droppy. If I tell you who gave me that advice. Oh, come it's, on. Uh, it, uh, okay. So one of my best friends up here in Vancouver, Canada is Douglas Copeland, author of generation X and Doug and I like to have a drink every now and then. And, uh, or maybe more than one and maybe more than two. And, uh, we get into talking about life and, yeah, he told me that I was in a particularly down place at one point and just trying to figure out, you know, what's what's the secret to being happy and well, what's the best way to live your life? And he said, David, it's very, very simple. Just there's something about you that makes you uniquely you. Figure out what that is and then go out there and be the biggest, craziest, wildest version of that uh, and you'll be happy. And I think that's a good piece of advice for anybody, no matter who it came from. Yeah, no, that is great advice. I love that. And that that really is ultimately uh, what we all want and who we all are. So with that, wh what do you think holds us back from actually doing that, David? Or is it shame? Is it embarrassment? Is it that we don't haven't heard that advice? What do you oh, think? That's a really good question. I think that a lot of us spend our lives being a version of ourselves that we think we are supposed to be instead of a version of ourselves that's true to who we really are on the inside. And it's actually a nice segue into the work that we do is the, with the value graphics project and the value graphics database, because value graphics are all about figuring out who people are on the inside, who they really are, not who they demographically are, because nobody acts their age. Gender doesn't dictate what we do. Just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're any different than before you had a PhD. All of those demographic markers are a lousy way for us to try and understand people, including ourselves. So we don't have much practice with this. We don't have a whole lot of practice figuring out who we really truly are, let alone with ourselves, let alone with target audiences and groups of people that we're trying to understand and inspire and motivate. Yeah, I think that's true too. And you caught me. That was absolutely my segue because that is it, right? That's no, but that's it, right? That's it, man. The values are what matters. It's what's inside, not what outside that matters. I mean, the fact that I wear white glasses, the only thing you can surmise is that I probably have a vision impairment. That's about it, right? There's nothing yeah. else there. Uh, now, that being said, you could say, well, heck, it matches your logo. So maybe you really like those white glasses, <laughs> but there's not much, I mean, there's not much more there. Is that, no. am I getting this or what? You're getting it entirely. I mean, so we've done 750,000, getting close to a million actually, surveys around the world now uh, in 152 languages across 180 countries. And we've measured what people actually care about deep inside their hearts, what their values are that drive everything that they do, as well as wants and needs and expectations and all these other things that are about the human condition. And what's fascinating about this database is the way it's built. If there's a data geek listening today, it's called a random stratified statistically representative sample of the population of planet Earth. A random strat stat rep like this has never been built before. It's enormous. Just building a small random strat stat rep is a big deal. Building one that's accurate for the entire planet is just like phew, statisticians light their hair on fire and run into the room when I tell them what we've done. But the reason I'm telling you all this is we can also look at it demographically. So for example, uh, let's think about it. Here's a stat. I'm going to give you two numbers to remember. First one, all across the board, every demographic label you can think of, gender, income, marital status, number of kids, education, all of that stuff. The people within those cohorts, those groups, they only resemble each other on average across the board 10.5% of the time. Baby boomers are only 10.5 similar. Men are only 10.5% similar. People who earn $100,000 a year are only 10.5% similar. So if you take baby boomers who earn $100,000 a year and happen to be male and pile them on top of each other and say, that's my target audience, you got a bigger group of people who only resemble each other about 10.5% of the time. And then we go and spend a million dollars and say, well, we know who they are. They're going to be terrible with technology. They're men, so they're going to like sports. Uh, so let's get some sports star who hates technology and they're going to be our spokesmodel. And that's like, that's where we go. We just use stereotypes 
to make stuff up about people once we think we know who they are based on what's on the outside. And you know, what's on the outside has nothing to do with what's on the inside. So, yeah, uh, demographics are a lousy way for us to understand each other. Oh, here's the other stat, I promise. 10.5% similarity. Now, the entire planet, all of us, just because we're alive and upright and breathing right now, we all agree with each other about 8% of the time. So it's only 2.5% more accurate to use demographics to understand your target audience than to use nothing at all and just say whatever the heck pops into your head. That's how accurate demographics are as a profiling tool. It's nonsense. Wow. It's why we get so excited when we see a 3% open rate on a direct marketing piece. We're like, whoa, 3%. That's, that's a 97% fail. And we're popping champagne corks because we did so well. We're such smart copywriters and we're such smart marketing people. Uh, it's 3%. We're using the wrong way to understand people. And so that's what we've tried to do is introduce something new. Wow. Well, if I was going to be 97% wrong, I probably wouldn't keep doing that, right? I mean, that would just sensibly, it would be like, dunk, wrong, dunk. I mean, come on, 3% of the time I actually get through. So when I when I read that st those stats in the book, I was like, come on, dude, that, that's, that can't possibly be right. And then of course, right. Statistically, obviously it is. So I'm not a math geek, but I'm a common sense guy. And that makes sense to me. Right. So with that 56 core human values that you all mapped out, I thought was interesting. Um, I, I was like, all right, lots of those completely make sense. Right. Lots of those completely make sense to me. Some not as much as others. So um, with that, right? So how do we, you know, how, how do we know what we value, David? Ah, well, how do you know what you value or how do I sure. know what you all value? Yeah, bo well, both, right? How do okay. I find that out? Because I might not have names or, or uh, one of those 56 core human values named out yet. Okay, cool. That's actually one of the reasons we did this, you know? Um, so let's just talk about that one little piece, the naming of these things. Values are the most powerful and important thing on earth. It drives everything that every human does. It's actually a neurological fact. There's a little piece inside your brain that make, you use to make all your decisions and it uses your values to make decisions on your behalf. So values drive what you do. Every one of us 24 seven, 365. But here's the way we've been dealing with them so far. It's through business poetry, I call it. You know, we sit around in a room and we go, the values of our people are about collaboration. We all like that word? Yeah, it's a good word. And uh, environmentalism, of course, or should it be sustainability? I don't know. I think environmentalism sounds better. And we have these conversations and we come up with a list of values. It's business poetry is what it is. They're the most powerful force on earth, driving everything that everyone does. And we're using these kind of subjective conversations about pretty words uh, as a way to figure out how to do something with these things. So... That's kind of kind of nonsense. Um, and what was your question? <laughs> I went down a hole. How do we find, no, no. Well, no, that's a good start. Oh, how do we, right? how do we know how what we the values it? are? Yeah, how do we right. find so scientists around the world, when they all talk, regardless of what language they speak, when they talk about a butterfly, they know that the name for butterfly is Lepidoptera. That's the scientific name for the butterfly family. And it's not a moth. It's a butterfly. It's a Lepidoptera. We need a set of values words that we all use so that when you're trying to say that joy is one of your biggest values and I'm trying to say it's happiness, we know whether we're talking about the same thing or not. We need a standardized set of words. So that was job one. We went out and talked to these 750, getting close to a million people, asked them all these questions, not about their values, but about their life about what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what keeps them up at night, what are they, all these questions about all these, these 10 different thematic clusters of questions, in fact. And we listened really hard and we saw patterns in the noise and we were able to take all that data and kind of dump it out on the dining room table and go, wow, this, this sorts into 56 piles. Now, that pile over there, think about it like Halloween candy, right? You dump the bag of Halloween candy you bring, your kid brings home and you, there's the chocolate bar pile and the, the box, of, there's the, the, you know, the lollipops and the bubble gum. Well, we found 56 piles in the data and each one has a name now. But within each of them, there's multiple variations. So that pile of chocolate bars, they're not all the same chocolate bar. So we have a pile called belonging. 
and all the ways that people all around the world talked about how they like to fit in and what it means, what it takes for them to feel like they fit in and uh, what, but what does belonging mean to them? There's 912 kinds of belonging in the belonging pile. And we have a code for every one of them. So when we work with a client, we say to them, belonging is really important for your target audience. And this is exactly what they mean when they talk about belonging. It's this code. So there's actually more than 8,000 codes for the way that the 56 values show up in our lives. So now we have this set of 56 values. We did not come into this with an idea about what they were going to be. The data told us, you told us, 750 close to a million people told us what the values were going to be. So now we have a common language, a common taxonomy, if you will. Uh, and we have a way to profile people and say, well, gosh, the people who are in that particular target audience who are going to grab something here, uh, who are going to buy this kind of lipsal uh, for chapped lips next week in the United States, those folks, the reason they're making that decision, because remember, it's our values that drive us to make every decision we make, the values they have in common that are making them like that kind of lipsal instead of this kind of lip balm are like this. And the ones that like this lip balm are like that. And so if you're the guy who runs marketing and sales for this lip balm, you know how you got to talk to them now. It's not about health and well-being. It's about social standing. What if it was social standing for lip balm? You'd need to make this out of a platinum container and call it a Louis Vuitton lip balm uh, and sell it for four times the price of regular lip balm and not in drugstores because people who are buying social status items don't want to buy them in drugstores. They want to buy them in uh, high-end pharmacies or something that's more in keeping with the social standing that they're looking for and the products that they buy. And the people who are interested in this one, what if they were health and well-being folks? That was one of their primary drivers that was pushing them towards this. Well, then you'd double down as the people behind this lip balm and you'd say, okay, let's put some vitamins in there. Some vitamins that soak in through your lips when you put this stuff on. Uh, and let's make it out of 100% uh, um, you know, uh, sustainably harvested, uh, uh, whatever you make, lip balm, gunk, whatever the gunk is. Uh, and let's make a percentage of the um, uh, proceeds are going to go to uh, kids in sports because health and well-being. So you start to understand the differences here. Now, where it gets really magic, if we profile the people who are after this one and the people who are after this one, and you can also find the places they overlap where they have the same values. Now, if this is the guy who's our client, we can get him to say all the right things to solidify the base and blow a little dog whistle that gets these people to go, huh, maybe we'll try that one next time. And they won't even know what hit them because they're not using values and they don't know what the values of their, their target audience are. Only this guy does. So it gets really fun and exciting when you start profiling organizational audiences. It can be employees or the talent pool. It can be who should we hire for one role or another, who our target audiences are for sales and marketing, all that kind of stuff. Wow. So there's this like big long quiz to get hired that they people hire you to bring in and uh, give them the quiz or how, do, how does that work in practicality? Right. So if let's go back to lip balm. If uh, let's say the yellow lip balm is our client and blue lip balm is not. Um, yellow lip balm calls us up and says, we want to understand people who are buying our lip balm. And by the way, can you also tell us people who are um, buying this other guy's lip balm because we want to steal their market share. Okay. So we find out a few things about this lip balm and this lip balm. And then we go out and do a little survey. We call it an unlocking survey. And we go out generally through social media and we say, hey, who wants to buy lip balm next week? And who thinks this one's kind of cool? And people go, oh, that's me. We go, cool. Can we ask you a couple of questions? And they sure. Um, and they fill out a few little questions for us. This is a live sample of people out there. It's got to be a statistically representative sample of whatever the yellow audience um, target audience is. So they're from the United States. They fit into a demographic profile, whatever it is. We get a sample of those folks to answer a few questions. That's just enough, just a few questions. 
what they tell us tells us where to go in to the benchmark study and pull out all the lookalike data and go, oh, it's you guys and it's you guys. And every time we see that data point, we know this one's right next to it. So let's pull that up. We kind of go shopping in the database with a little basket on our arm and we pull all the cool stuff out for that particular target audience and go back to the client and say, here's what we learned about your people. Here's what makes them tick. and What you got to say to get them to buy more. And here's what we learned about those guys and how you can steal some of them and get them to come over to your backyard barbecue and hang around with you. So that's how it goes. Yeah. It's so, pretty cool. so that is pretty cool. So, and what's the, what's the statistical significance of that? If you if it's 10.5, which is really two and a half percent. Yeah. yeah. What's the number here then on the other side with the value graphics? Well, um, we see audiences as, much as eight times more aligned than when you use demographics. So uh, a group of people who you understand what their shared core values are, they'll resemble each other on all the other things about who they are and how they make their decisions and what's important to them as much as 89% of the time. So what it really boils down to is you got a buck you're spending demographically, you're gonna get about a 10% hit at best if you do everything perfectly, which you won't, which is why we get happy with a 3% response rate. So yeah, let's say 10, let's say you're perfect. You get an absolute 10% response by only using demographic information. Layer the values on top, you can get as high as an 89% similarity within that cohort. That's how targetable they are. So you can get an 89 cent dollar instead of a 10 cent dollar. It's basically like taking your marketing budget and multiplying it by eight and that's how much more effective and efficient it'll be. Now, here's the other really cool thing. All these people around the world that we talk to, we also ask them, hey, how much more would you pay for something that you felt reflected your values? So you're standing in the grocery store. We've all done this by which kind of coffee am I going to buy? Um, one's cheaper and one's better for the planet. Depending on what your values are, you're going to make a snap decision about which one you're going to buy. People will pay as much as 13% more for the product that aligns with their values. So here's a great, here's a great example. I love this one because it's about Oreo cookies, my favorite cookies. And Oreo cookies, if I tell this story often enough, will call me up one day and say, David, we're going to give you a lifetime supply of Oreo cookies. How many do you eat in a week? And then they'll be surprised when I tell them how many I eat. Oreo cookies last year made $4 billion in gross sales. That's a lot of Oreo cookies. Now, we know 13% is the number I gave you for return on values across the board, but individual categories are different. So the category of everyday household expenses, people will pay as much as 8% more for something that aligns with their values. So on a $4 billion gross revenue, that means Oreo cookies could make about $320 million extra every year just by saying to their consumers, we see you, we know what you care about. We changed a word on our packaging. We did some social media in a different way that's more about what you care about and less about what we think you care about. We found a way to connect to you and talk to you like the human beings that we know you are. So what do you got to lose? All you got to do is change up the way you position stuff, the way you talk, the way you present your case, Make it less about what you think is important and more about what they are looking for. And you can make an extra 320 million, Mr. Oreo cookies. Uh, what if I'm half wrong and you only make an extra 160 million? Uh, isn't that worth giving it a little try? And all you gotta do is change the way you think about, your, the, about people uh, and you're good to go. So it's kind of a no brainer. Um, Understanding the values of whoever you're trying to engage and influence and inspire. It's a secret, it's a secret weapon. And uh, we've just started. So not a lot of people are doing this yet. And it's a chance for the underdog to really, you know, in any product category, come in and, and uh, make a big difference. Wow. Wow. And I'm going to guess that you probably eat less than $160 million in Oreo cookies a year. <laughs> is, that, is that a fair guess? It's close. <laughs> That's be close, right? Yeah, that plus your consulting fee probably yeah. would more than be paid for, right? Yeah, you got it. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. So That's fun. So yeah, it makes your budgets more effective and people will pay you more. Why wouldn't you do this?
That is a great question. Yeah. So why don't people do this, David? Uh, because I'm little old David in Vancouver, Canada. If I was McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group and I had this information, it would be worldwide by now. We're pushing a, you know, we're pushing a, a, a big, big uh, rock up the side of the mountain here. Uh, we're asking people to change how they think about people. We've all been taught how to do this for millennia, that the right way to think about people is look at a group of people and say, well, gee, they're mostly women. This is, my audience is 75% female. So what are you going to do with that? You're going to make everything pink? It's kind of a useless fact. Uh, and then well, they're 18 to 24 years old. And so what are you going to do with that? You're going to, well, uh, what are 18 to 24 year olds like? They like um, hip hop. Uh, so it's going to be pink and it's going to have some hip hop music in it somehow. And so you just use all these ridiculous stereotypes that we fall into. Um, and it seems innocent enough and you know, it's our money. We want to spend it in a way that only gets us 10 cents on the dollar. Who cares? It's up to the individual organization, but there's a, there's a, there's a much larger reason why we need to shift and start thinking outside, um, these demographic and psychographic ways of looking at people. That's because when we keep doing that, when we keep saying to each other in our boardrooms around the world that the right way to think about people is to decide whether they're male or female, rich or poor, young or old, gay or straight, black or white, what we're doing is leading ourselves down a road where we have to use stereotypes. And those stereotypes lead to ageism and sexism, and racism, and homophobia, and dot, 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 dot. These are all issues that are just like we're fueling these fires with this um, dominance of demographic stereotypes that we continue to see in the world. And if you don't think it's happening, you just need to go into a toy store and look at the pink toys and the blue toys. Of course it's happening. People in toy companies are sitting around making decisions based on stereotypes why are there no toys for girls that are about, I don't know, uh, blue stuff uh, instead of pink stuff? I'm, I don't have any kids, so I'm having a hard time thinking about what a toy might be. But uh, it's uh, well, a football, right? Instead of, uh, you know, a football player, instead of, you know, a doctor or instead yeah. of something, right? And instead of that, right? Because really... A little boy can play football. A little boy can be a doctor. A little girl can play football. A little girl can be a uh, yeah. Can play, right. I mean, any of that. Right. There's no. And it's yeah, and it's, and, and we get we get all excited and we like do like the big applause for like Mattel when they come out with you know um, astronaut Barbie uh, because finally somebody's doing it. it's like okay yay good for you Mattel but all the other stuff is still you know very much stereotyped. It's um, we, let's we'll move into the workplace. You know how hard it is for someone over the age of 45 to get a job? And it's not because of their qualifications. It's because they're 45, which for some reason makes organizations go, no, no, we don't want any, no, we want young people. Well, why do you want young people? Well, because they're young. It's like, okay. Cool. So the ageism that's inherent in the workplace and our hiring culture is the direct result of these stereotypes we have in our head about what young people are all about and what old people are all about. If there isn't a field of um, business, there isn't a, a component part of what a business is that isn't somehow dwelling in these outdated ideas that are based on demographics and what it used to mean back in the day. Because, you know, millennia ago, we all had to behave in certain ways based on our demographics. There was a there was an imperative. There was a demographic imperative. If you were in a small little rural village in northern France in the 1300s, uh, first rule of podcasting, turn off the outside um, phone. Give me a second here. Uh, if you're in that little tiny village in the north of France and you're a 13 year old girl and you hadn't started to make babies, you weren't doing your part. That was your job by that age to be married and creating a family so that your little village, your little group on the, in this sort of dog eat dog world that you lived in survived. You had to make the next generation. And if you were a, a, a young boy, 
uh, and let's say 13, 14 years old, and you weren't out with a spear, like getting, killing the woolly mammoth and bringing it home for dinner so that people could eat, then you weren't doing your part. So age and gender and income, the rich people in town had a thing to do and the poor people, they knew what their lot in life was. If you weren't following the demographic rules, society fell apart. Things didn't work. And the guys down the street in the next village would see that that's going on. They come and take over. So you had to. There was no choice. But today, thanks to this leveling influence of technology, we all get to kind of curate our lives however we want. Baby boomers that retire don't have to stop they don't have to sit and knit in a rocking chair and whittle on a stick. Uh, but there was a time when that was their job. That's what they were supposed to do. So I don't know. I think that um, we need to give our head a shake and realize that in this time where we've found a better way, a new way and uh, a disruptive way for everything from space travel to uh, pizza delivery to car ownership to vacation rentals, everything. We're rethinking everything. But we've yet to sit down and rethink this fundamental piece of how all of that stuff comes to be, which is determining who is our target audience, what are they all about, what do they care about deep inside their hearts, and how can we connect with them in a way that's going to make a difference. Haven't, haven't rethought that. We're still using the, the, the same system from thousands and thousands of years ago. Yeah, well, maybe the good old days that people talk about is when everybody had those same types of values based on their have to, and they don't even realize that those were values back then, that those were must haves. Yeah. And so maybe that's maybe that's what people are longing for. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Well, you know, when you go and see um, when you go and see a shrink, they don't like being called that. When you go and see a therapist. Uh, they put you, they like, lie down here on my nice comfy sofa and let's talk about your life. You're unhappy. That's why you're here. Something, something isn't working for you the way you would like it to work. So what they do is talk to you about your life and what's going on. And they talk to you about what's important to you and what are your values, and what drives you. And they look for that misalignment. And then their whole work as a therapist is about trying to bring those things into alignment. They call you adjusted once you've hit that place where your values and your reality are the same. When you're misaligned, you're unadjusted. You're, you're somebody who's having trouble getting through the course of your, your days and your weeks and your months. They bring you back into alignment and they send you off into the world a happy, well-adjusted person. That's, I think, a whole lot of what's behind many things that are going on in the world today. And by using value graphics to start to look at groups of people and understand who they are, in a way we're doing, in a way we're doing a much more important job than just selling our stuff uh, and, and marketing our things. We're, we're teaching ourselves and everyone we come into contact with that the correct way to do this not just look at the values of your target audience, but let's create products and services and brands and things and ideas and institutions that are aligned with what people care about. There's so much unhappiness in the world, so much divisiveness in the world, so much rage and so much um, unhappiness. And I think it's because we're vastly out of alignment with our values. You know, get philosophical for a moment. I don't think I've ever done this on a podcast before. Uh, the world around us is a series of, um, let's call them institutions that we created for ourselves. Education, government, politics, banking, finance, et cetera, religion. And we, we invented these things to serve us a long time ago, a long, 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 long time ago. And they've been changing at this sort of glacial pace over the course of centuries. They're very similar to what they were thousands of years ago. Politicians and, and democracy today is fairly recognizable from what it was way back when. The church is fairly recognized. Education, I mean, there's been some change, but it's been, it's very, very similar. What's changed dramatically 
is us. So these institutions we invented to serve us and who are kind of down here doing this thing, if it's a graph and we've come along and we've changed to a point where, you know, a, a, a middle-aged guy in, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a city uh, in the United States has an entirely different set of values and things they're focused on than that same person with the same demographics would have had even 50 years ago. And yet it's the same institutions, the same world that is trying to figure, and this gap keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So until we figure out how to talk to each other and institute a world based on what we care about today, not some idea of what was important thousands of years ago, we won't be able to get those institutions to change and catch up. And this is gonna be a continuing divide. We're seeing it play out all around the world in all kinds of ways that we don't need to get into because we're all very aware of them. It's on the news every single night. We're trying to live a life based on our values and the world we've created around us doesn't allow for that because it was it's based on this old, 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 olden days way of thinking. Wow. So, so David, if that's true, and I, be I believe it is, that I mean, that makes so much sense to me. How do we get started bridging that gap? How do we get started pulling us back into alignment? Instead mm. of being so maladjusted, let's get readjusted and let's let's get aligned. How do we start there with your, you know, with the death of demographics and understanding that values and value graphics is where it's at? Well, the very first thing we have to do is take a look at ourselves. Uh, if kind of goes back to that opening piece of advice I had, right? We need to dig deep inside ourselves and realize who really are we? And in the process of doing that, it's going to show us some things about who are the people around us. The people that we get along with the best in our lives are the ones who have values similar to ours. That's a that's just a fact. The people who we get along with, so the, the one person whose values are so aligned with ours, if we're lucky, that's the person we marry and settle down with and spend the rest of our lives together because we're values symbiotic. So if we can start to realize that values are truly driving the conversation, values are how we all live our lives, then that's got to eventually bleed out and become part of how we inform the decisions that we make. The people in power need to start to realize this. The people who are running companies, our little database and the work we're doing with organizations around the world to help them shift the way they think about people and bring values back into the boardrooms of the nation and of the world. It's, it's like a Trojan horse, right? If we can get them most the wealthiest, largest uh, organizations in the world with the biggest megaphones, to start thinking about people this way, they're gonna be able to do it much faster than I'll ever do it. And so by helping them make money, uh, we're, we're, we're actually getting this word out there into the world that there's a better way to do stuff. That's all I know how to do. Uh, from here, I have to hope that we've planted a seed that this database um, has uh, started to move things in the right direction, that if corporate, entities are thinking this way, that it'll bleed out if all the people who work in those organizations, the people those organizations interact with, and everything will come back to, I don't know, some big kind of giant cosmic head shake where we go, hey, whoa, wait a minute, what have we been doing? Why aren't we thinking about each other in a different way? That's a great place to wrap up this conversation, but we are not done, David. We are going to talk about sales and leadership another time. But before yeah. we do, though, I want to, folks, David has given away some of his best work for us. He's given us three videos to check out and learn more about this. If you go to valuegraphics.com slash Phil, just like it sounds, valuegraphics.com slash Phil, David's got three awesome videos up there for you and some more information on getting connected with him. So I'd encourage you to check that out. But David, if, if uh, is there like a social media channel if people have questions that they can go to to connect with you? Or is it best just to go to that website? Or what do you what do you think? Yeah, so um, come to me on LinkedIn. That's where I spend most of my time. I want to double check that URL. I have a feeling it might be valuegraphics.online backslash Phil because that's the normal URL that we give away. So uh, if 
Uh, for some reason, the teams managed to figure out how to do it with a .com. That's news to me. I think it's valuegraphics.online backslash Phil. Uh, but I see you giving that a shot there. So LinkedIn is oh, a great no, way. You're right. You're right. I will fix that. Keep talking. Okay. Okay. Value graph uh, so value graphics online backslash Phil. That gets you those three videos just so you know what you're getting. One of them talks to you about how value graphics plays nice with demographics and psychographics. One of them talks about how to tell other people how important values can be with a little story about three friends in an alley at midnight. And the last one gives you three questions you can use to start getting to understand the values of the people around you and that you want to understand and influence and engage and motivate. So the three very, it's, think of it like a little crash course in, in, uh, in value graphics. But yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Valuegraphics.com is uh, where the research company website lives. And then also there's a second website if anyone's interested. I have a, a, a I spend a lot of time as a public speaker and um, my books, they're all on their own website, which is davidallisoninc.com. So uh, yeah, lots of ways to connect. And we're, we're very um, prolific, let's say, on social. I think if you just did a Google search, you'd find us if that's, if that's all you take away from today. <laughs> That's fantastic, David. I appreciate all of that very, very much. So valuegraphics.online slash Phil, as David kindly corrected me. Thank you for that, David. So we get that right. And then get more connected with David. Either find him on LinkedIn, go to davidallisoninc.com. Get to know David Allison. David, this is not our last conversation. I so value all you shared today. I so value you writing this book. This information must get out. There's so much there. We didn't even scratch the surface of what we're going to talk about. So I just want to say thank you, and I can't wait to talk to you again, my friend.